to, to um, share data. And this, um, um, this work was starting in 2015, uh, and there are a number of activities that are already um, supported, underpinned by the work of this forum, for instance, the Electronic Freight Transport Information Regulation. More recently, in November 2023, the Commission adopted uh, a communication on uh, the creation of a European space European mobility data space. So the first step to create this mobility data space. Um, the idea here of this data space is to facilitate the access, sharing, pooling of data from different existing or future source of data. So really help the use of, of this data, the creation of new services, of innovative services, and the transparency for both passengers and freight operators. I will not go through what we have done in, uh, in the research under Horizon Europe because the project will give already an idea of what, uh, what we tend to fund. I just would like to say that it's clear that we want to support digitalization, um, developing the development and deployment of new digital services to harness the power of all these new technologies. And I wish to conclude this very brief introduction by saying that digital transformation of logistics is definitely a collective effort. And we need uh, partnerships, we need collective commitments, we need uh, innovation, we need foresight, so for really to, for the future. We will keep funding digitalization of the freight transport uh, and supporting this policy. And I just want to mention, for instance, that there is going to be a call on upscaling innovation and uh, supporting physically internet that will open in May 2024. So this year, in a few months, with the closing date in September. So should you be interested, please look into to this call. This brief in introduction, um, on this, I pass the floor to Thomas Ambra, I'm sorry, Dr. Thomas Ambra. And Thomas is a technical director at Inlecon Group, and he focuses on transversal topics that concern data, business modeling, simulation modeling, and artificial intelligence, as well as policies and initiatives that bring relevant technological solutions closer to reality and end users. I'd like to, to say that Thomas won the prize from uh, DigiMove uh, in 2018. Um, it was for intermodal and synchromodal freight transport. So thank you very much, Thomas, the floor is yours. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Paola, for the introduction. So uh, I'm going to talk about something called planet. Planet, you know all of it. We live there. It's not that kind of planet, but the planet to which I'm referring is actually the progress towards federated logistics through the integration of TNT into global trade network. The project also set a base a little bit, um, and I'm going to point out some recommendations that potentially also led to the scaling up innovations uh, through the physical internet. So what I'm going to do, I'm not going to spend too much time on the methods, because that's also not the main point of this conference, as we heard at the plenary session as well. I'm going to try to focus on the main results and uh, the numbers which came out of these results. And then I will focus also on the recommendations for CEF, uh, Horizon Europe, and so on. So Planet, what is it? Uh, Planet brought together 33 participants from 14 countries. These consisted of private, public, and also R&D companies. The budget was around 7 million euros, you can see over here, and it finished in May 2023. And the main cases that I'm going to show you today also involve a bit more uh, GS1 in Poland, China, and also some components which we uh, took from IBM as well for, for the cloud uh, infrastructure. So what are the main objectives or what were the main objectives um, before May? Number one was to create and generate simulation capabilities for the assessment of expected impact of new trade routes. So for this, you can use simulation models because they also give you this kind of risk-free environment where you can test a lot of what is scenarios. Objective number two was to build an open cloud-based ICT infrastructure facilitating the implementation of EGTN 
In this case, EGCN stands for the European Global Trade Network, the, the transport network. It also includes L, the logistics part, which is not included there. And objective number three is to uh, employ or deploy three living labs, which I'm going to show you today uh, for the results as well. And number four is to formalize also the EU roadmap, which was in uh, unison with the roadmap also proposed by Alice, which came out of the SENSE project as well. Now, the, the scope and the results uh, cover these three living labs. So it's quite a pan-European project, as you can see here, because it also involves China and the, and the international flows, as we know them, from Asia to Europe. So living lab number one focused mainly on uh, the blockchain applications and the physical internet. And here uh, we assess the main blockchain capabilities, uh, AI features, Internet of Things, digital clones and simulation models, where the clones were actually called agent-based models, if, in case you would be wondering as well. And this one also went through the very famous West Canal that everybody knows after uh, the COVID situation when uh, there was a massive blockage as well. Number two uh, is focusing more on the synchromal dynamic management of the CNC intercontinental flows, uh, where you see that I'm going to cherry pick the blockchain applications together with uh, the AI applications as well. And here we have a nice case because it actually reached commercialization level as well. So it has a post-project life, um, this kind of assistant that was employed there. And lastly, living lot number three is focusing on the Silk Road. So the Silk Road is another, another word for the flows between Asia or coming from China to Europe as well. And here I'm going to talk, talk about mainly the IoT devices deployed and also the cross-border problems and how you can actually achieve cost reductions and a lot of CO2 emission reductions and the decrease of customs operations and costs related to those. So number one was about a physical internet and blockchain. Um, here the main idea was to actually test the new concepts such as IoT, AI and the blockchain as well. Also to improve the processes, focusing on the D2D, which are actually door-to-door -door services and linking those to the maritime and Silk Road EU corridors. And this was applied to two use cases. One was focused on the flows uh, that went from China to Spain more, more, more frequently, or more specifically, Valencia, Barcelona, and Algeciras ports. And then use case number two was focused on uh, the last mile deliveries as well. So for your information, each living lab has sub use cases. Sometimes you have also four use cases for one living lab, uh, three of them for the other. So if I sum them up, it's around 15 use cases or 13. I will not go through all because we don't have simply the time for it, but I will try to cherry pick the, the ones which are quite relevant for this conference today. And this stems from living lab number two, which is about a synchronous dynamic management of the TNT. So here, what you can see here, I'm not sure the pointer is here. I'm going to focus on this red circle, which actually concerns the board of Rotterdam. It's a solution deployed by uh, Pantea as well. If you have a look, I don't have a mic, so I'm going to stay here. There's also this kind of documentation, electron documentation, which you can generate and you can also have for those with very good eyes, especially there in the back, an ECMR element, which you can actually get out of it as well. So ECMR is applicable to roads, so you know very well. And here, the, the main purpose of developing this case was to um, collect shippers' data, digitalize those, share them, manage them in the multimodal shipment documentation, and perform digitalized customs as well. And this was done for declarations. Also, it reduced paperwork, so we were shifting from paper-based documents to paperless documents, which is quite interesting in terms of streamlining a lot of processes as well, and not dealing with papers, also saving a lot of trees, because you need trees to, to be cut down to get paper as well. And you also reduce document preparation uh, and also digitalize and distribute the labor better. This real-time documentation is also good to have some kind of transparency over operations in terms of what's happening where. So that's also good to know. And this was uh, linked to fully digitalizing the customs declarations in the UK because, as you know, they're troublemakers, so they actually left the, UK, the EU. And this also means that this kind of a negative uh, implication was converted into something positive because you do have new services and new digitalized services which actually make sense as well. So potentially without Brexit this would not happen. Which means that all of this led to the cost reduction by 20 to 30 percent, which means that these costs were connected to declaration costs uh, between uh, the Netherlands and the UK. And the solution was adapted in 2020 um, through 600 transactions and this actually increased in 2023 to 100,000 transactions, which is quite interesting. 
What are the next steps you might be asking? So the next steps are that uh, there has been an app uh, a patent pending, which is actually now in application form. And this product or the service was also kind of scaled up or commercialized and it's known by uh, the key connect in case you'll be interested. Uh, I also dropped the, the link there as well. The, the living lot number three, which is my second cherry pick, is focused on the railway uh, transportation statuses between China and Poland as well, which means that here there was a lot of uh, unautomated things happening. So things were actually sent uh, and received by email. So there was no uh, system in place whatsoever. And this also led to a high cost and time of keeping cargo at a terminal, which also meant that you had to look for a truck uh, for quite some time as well. And the more time you spend on looking for a truck, the more demerit and detention costs you incur as well. So time is money, and especially in this case, it uh, counts double. So I'm not gonna spend too much uh, time on the information that was lacking here, but I'm gonna focus on the solution areas. Solution area number one was done through the IoT devices and telematics devices. So IoT stands for the Internet of Things, and the app SIC is actually an electronic uh, parcel code uh, information service. And this is something interesting that you will learn about it in my solution area number two. And this allowed us to monitor the real-time cargo information and also the events and to optimize those events. So this EPSIC is also connected to GS1 because EPSIC is actually a standard. And there was this EPSIC platform developed to actually integrate these standards of GS1, especially uh, coming from China to Poland, which means you have GS1 Poland and GS1 China involved as well. So hence, there was standardization of the information flows. You need standards. Some people say we don't, but you do need standards. And this also facilitated the digitalization and the interaction between different entities. And as I said before, this was applied to the parcel monitoring between the China and uh, Polish flows. So the results, <coughs> here are some numbers, and I will give you some explanation will actually underpin these numbers. So there was a reduction of disruptions of the supply chains by 15%. What does it mean? It's just a number. It means that there was a higher availability of unloading slots, which increased. So if you have more slots where you can unload, you also uh, decrease bottlenecks and um, cascading effects. 20% reduction in CO2 emissions. What does it mean? That means that through digitalization, through track and trace, and through transparency, you have also a lot of customers who were happy with the products and they could actually see uh, what was happening. So based on that, you get less complaints and based on that, you get less reshipments as well. So you have actually uh, less loads that you have to uh, deploy and dispatch. 10% reduced compliance costs. This actually refers to the customs and they actually decrease their working time, which also save money. 50% improved visibility that was done through the EPSIC platform using the EPSIC standard of GS1 as well. And this was applicable at all stages of the transportation from China all the way to Europe. 15% means that there was higher customer experience, and this was done by a survey of the users of the system who did it. So 15% increase in satisfaction and 8% increase in volumes, which means that this was uh, simplified through automation of different processes. <coughs> and then we have number 10. So 10% refers to the reduced operational cost. And this means that in total monthly working time, um, which decreased, this means around eight hours per, per, per month was decreased uh, based on this automation as well, which also saves uh, money as well. So the conclusion recommendations, as I said before, I do not have the time to cover living lab number one. So if you want to have more details at your disposal, you can visit the Planet Project website, but also the ETP Alice website because they did a dissemination piece there as well. So they have a nice summary on their website. Living lab number two, what did we learn and what did we do? We basically expanded the infrastructure by different logistics hubs and platforms, being actually the one where you have the ECMR integration. Uh, we productionalized or commercialized the, the platform into the key connect as well. And the regulatory acceptance of electronic documents and signatures in EU was also accepted. Potentially this ECMR, e ECMR can be connected to the FT that Paola just mentioned in her introductory speech as well. Legal matters probably are the biggest bottlenecks when it comes to these kind of integration and interoperability issues, especially when it comes to synchro modal management and also the physical internet because uh, legal issues are there to stay, of course. 
Living law number two, what did we learn? What did we do there? We increased the cooperation between the two business partners. This is very feasible. It worked. Uh, it was tangible. And there was also the feasibility of implementing GSY standards in this new Silk Road. And when, when was this examined? And it was also deployed within the Living Labs as well. And also we had to develop solutions. We increased the awareness of the physical internet. And the implementation has a very good business potential because GS1 also covers quite a few companies uh, all over the world as well. This leads me to my two last slides when it comes to recommendations because it's also good to reap the benefits of these results and try to transpose them to policymakers as well. <coughs> so for ITSEF, uh, for connecting your facilities, uh, you have different implementation of PTS. So these are poor community systems which have different silos in standards, potentially produced by IPCSA, but we need more harmonization in those different silos. Um, you can ask me a question why, but I don't have the time to say why now. Uh, application of IoT sensors and ensuring full 5G coverage. So if you have beautiful flows coming through different countries, the problem is that if you rely on 5G connectivity, there's actually no cross-border handshake between 5G countries. And there are projects such as 5G Blueprint and so on who are trying to solve this. And this falls under DigiDigi -Digi Connect, and DG Connect is sometimes disconnected from DG Move, but they merge departments, which is good. They're going to work together. Uh, so that's also very positive. We should also ensure that stakeholders uh, have the necessary digital infrastructure and potentially we could introduce subsidies to actually onboard them. And this also uh, applies mainly to SMEs because not all SMEs have massive R&D departments when you have 100 system architects and software developers. And also improve the procedures at the border crossings, which is quite crucial. More technical things, which are quite interesting because we talk about a digital age, but nobody really talks about increasing the computational power of the cloud infrastructure as well. So if you have more and more data coming into the system, potentially also coming through FT and so on, we also need more computing power and cloud infrastructure, which is also being provided or devised by Gaia X, for instance, when you have the European Worker Service. And we also need more action on cybersecurity and also more uh, about the capabilities, as I said before. Now, these are the last ones. So that was Ceph. Uh, now we have Horizon Europe, which is more research oriented. So you have TRL 1 up to TRL more or less 9. But for actions, for uptaking and developments of digital collaborative platforms, what we need is also state of the art models and data sharing technologies, which are also then connected to the EMDS, as Paola mentioned before. We also need member states. Uh, with their platforms because you have also different initiatives like the beautiful EDIC initiative, which is the European Data Infrastructure Consortium. Sorry, European Digital Infrastructure Consortium. Nobody really knows about that, but this is happening as well. And it's also good to uh, onboard the SMEs because as I said, SMEs, they are a crucial part of our economy and we cannot rely only on the few big companies who are doing this. Last, harmonization of process and data exchange. Again, this is something important for RIA actions and innovation actions. And for point number two is to improve the governance. And here we also connect to the physical internet digital infrastructure. So potentially this also led to the birth of the, the call on the physical internet. I do not know, maybe. But lastly, and this is my really last slide, actions to promote the blockchain technologies and smart contracts. We also need uh, what I call transactional protocols and I added converters. Because if you have converters, that also means that you can convert different data formats from let's say TIC 4.0 to DCSA, and these converters uh, do not exist in an automated way. So hence AI can actually, uh, or more specifically machine learning, can actually solve these kind of issues. Digital documents, digitalization is also the point of uh, the FT regulation, which is coming up. So it's gonna be mandatory since 2026 now, used to be 25, I think. <coughs> Safe data exchange and lastly also stable outlook for investors who want to invest in blockchain technology as well. And uh, action step or action cluster number four is to have improved AI and machine learning, machine learning algorithms and also to connect optimization models with simulation models as well. These things are quite disconnected still. Companies do not really understand what a simulation model does and what an optimization model does. Then you have also things called simulation-based optimization models. And sometimes it's easier to just forget about pure mathematics and sigma science and integrations, but try to be more user-friendly and visualize the outputs that you want to convey to the policymakers and stakeholders because they don't have a PSG mathematics as well. So that's also something that we need to think about when we present results. And integration, with digital twins, that's also something on the on the very high agenda, I would say. 
And these are basically another, another word, sometimes which is misused. Some people use it for simulation models, but digital twins are basically simulation models which are connected to real-time data fetching tools, and you can inter integrate them and incorporate them in your daily business as well. So this is something of recommendations that uh, the planet boasts towards the policymakers as well. And here I would like to stop and thank you for this. In case you have concrete questions which concern the planet project, I'm referring you to Makis or Gerasimos. He was the project coordinator of planet as well. So if you have concrete questions, you can try to email him also with me in CC if you want, of course. So that's it from my side. If you have any questions, I'm not sure if you want to take the questions now or afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for the recommendations for the commission. Not sure that we can support absolutely everything, but we'll definitely, definitely take it into consideration. And thank you for keeping the time. So we pass the floor now to the second speaker, Dimitri Laureis for the EP Center project. And Dimitris has been working at the port of Antwerp, Bruges as business analyst on the EP Center um, project for the past three years. Um, he embodies passion for digitalization and innovation with strong collaboration skills. Thanks, Dimitris, for the collaboration skills. So please, the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes. <laughs> Check the time. Uh, thank you, Paola, for the introduction. And as mentioned, today I will be um, talking about the result of the Epicenter project, which is, as many projects here, about enabling resilient, efficient, and greener supply chains. A quick note about the consortium. It's uh, 35 companies, which is a very varied group, which includes industry partners such as AB InBev and Panasonic, for example, research institutions. Uh, ports and technology providers. So there's a lot of different insights combined in this consortium. We have three demonstrators. Um, I'll go through each of them. Well, not I'll not go through each of them, but the EpiLink is about data sharing and digitalization focus. So really how to apply new technologies and what we can learn from them. EpiNode is what I often call the hard technologies demonstrator, where we have Hyperloop, um, electric and automated trucks and uh, the connectainer which i'll show an example of and then we have the arctic case which is about a growing interest in transport through the arctic region um, i've been told subtly that collisions with whales and icebergs is less of an issue for road transport so i won't be talking about that today Let's start with EpiNote, which, as I said, uh, contains Hyperloop, Connectainer, and the pods we will see in a moment. The Hyperloop case is um, not what you might, example, uh, might expect if you know the technology. It's not the large, uh, long-distance kind of Hyperloop that's mostly talked about, but it's an uh, investigation into the potential of using the technology to um, make the Volkswagen plant at Wolfsburg uh, more environmentally friendly when it comes to getting the different parts at the actual site and the different parts of the site. Um, what is a bit missing from this picture is that this highway that's going up, it's actually almost a one direction hi highway from north to south and then it ends almost at the plant. And there's a lot of congestion around the town which causes a lot of noise issues and of course local pollution. So they're looking at the potential of creating a logistics center and then using a cargo loop based on Hyperloop technology, which does the local distribution um, of those parts. A small note, the people working on this case are in the room. So if you have any questions on that after the session, Walter is just taking pictures of the slide over there. So you can find them. To give a bit more of an idea of the, the specs that we have here, um, this is not a container sized tube it's uh, used more for pallet sized transport they can transport about 10,000 square meters a day and their speeds aren't the thousands or however fast it normally goes it's a bit slower at 100 to 150 kilometers an hour which makes it a bit easier to implement and also allows the use of tracks over needing maglev technology for example which reduces the cost and the complexity a bit 
this is how their intermodal logistics service part could look like where you actually go from trucks to the tube that does the local distribution of the cargo so this is actually a solution to get some trucks off the road and the impact of that you can see here where i think this is the pointer here you see a co2 comparison between let's call it classic transport diesel based to electric vehicles to the cargo loop where you see the biggest difference is of course in operation both electric vehicles and the hyperloop solution are a lot more efficient when it comes to co2 but cargo loop is a bit more interesting because the wait which was it again the well to the blue the big blue bar is a lot smaller for cargo loop so here you see as well when it comes to operational costs that it's going to be a lot cheaper than current solutions um, for any questions that there might be about capex or the capital expenditure i refer to the people in the room because uh, those calculations are not included in this yet a second solution within epi notes and this is perhaps the most applicable today is uh, from our partner einrides who is doing the transition from diesel trucks to electric trucks and then finally to automated electric trucks so they have different solutions on one hand you have things like this which is a trailer with extra batteries to extend the range of your electric trucks um, but they also have this fancy looking pod they call it um, which can have either a cab or a container on top of it which is cabless so there's no driver in there um, and it has the option to carry a container but it also has the option to be remote controlled so i call this working towards the work from home uh, truck driver where he can control five to ten trucks is the final intention uh, for at a distance of course requiring a 5g network how do they see the transition towards this today at an operational level they're really working on making diesel uh, electric trucks available to different providers for example they're working together with Maersk in north america to provide like 300 electric trucks on a certain trajectory and then those trucks to see where they're most interesting they use their digital solution first to see where there is there actually a potential to start using the trucks based on charging stations uh, based on traffic conditions etc and then those trucks also start collecting data and after a while they see a move to autonomous electric trucks becoming possible within our project it was a very practical case so they actually had they worked together with the testing side and these are some pictures from the movie where they did tests for example with intersections with cyclists uh, with a pedestrian which is actually crossing the road here and also other traffic involved um, working towards more and more autonomous operation today their pods are capable of working on enclosed spaces for example they want to work more towards predictable trajectories and then flexible trajectories in the end um, they have an entire video available on this which you can access through for example the epicenter site which is also very interesting to go and watch where you see the pod actually driving around in the second phase and which is what they're working on now um, they are working on a digital twin to allow cheaper simulations as a first step in taking next steps in their automation so this is one example of what they've been building here you see a more practical example of a, a pod in action which they are using to prepare for next cases in, in practical scenarios and then you have the connectainers which is actually a solution that tries to solve the empty imbalance between ports between 20 foot and 40 foot containers um, by allowing the containers to be the containers to be combined uh, two 20 foot containers can be combined into a single 40 foot i will come back to the results of this case in the synchromodal logistics algorithms uh, example because there we had simulations using this compared to the classic where you drive the container back to the depot then we get to epilink um, which is as i mentioned the more digitalization focused demonstrator and here's a quick, quick example of what we're doing in the synchromodal logistics algorithms case um, this solution allows the mapping of very complex logistics problems 
taking into account the network and the different operators and looking at different alternatives that can be used to get transport done. Um, it's a step towards the physical internet as well, because there you will need a lot more advanced systems. So the innovative part here is we were able to do it a lot faster than previously was possible and on a lot bigger scale. Uh, this, is, this example is for imports through the port of Antwerp, but here's one, another one. We also had, like Thomas, Silk Road cases. Um, an interesting thing about the Silk Road case during the project was that a war broke out and the Northern Corridor travels through Russia and Belarus. So you, we saw a lot of shifts in cargo. Um, initially, everyone was going towards the middle corridor. But of course, that needed to be seen. How can we handle the last, the, the last mile if we go through that corridor? And our tool actually allowed these kind of calculations. Um, practical results. This is another case where we perform some simulations for the port of Algeciras. And here you can see the results of ap applying the algorithm on existing data, where they looked at, at all the transport that was being done from the port towards the hinterland. And they applied their algorithms to see, to, to optimize using different transport modes. And I'm going to focus on the one metric that's easiest to interpret. The total kilometers traveled by truck was possible to reduce by 20%. Now I mentioned if you add Connectainer to this, they did more tests. And the advantage here is that you can reposition your container and redistribute it in a different format. So for example, moving the 40 feet empty to a depot and then using both 20 feet full instead of empty by maritime transport. And they were able to improve by another 3% in this case, for example. Finally, an important part of what we did was also focused on the data sharing platform where we worked with partner Nextport International. And they were involved in all the cases where data actually needed to be shared with it, between partners, which is why they set up the transatlantic community. But again, uh, these are some examples, but I'm going to focus on this one because it ties in nicely to the previous presentation again. Um, important steps that we took there is indeed, you see a lot of rise in the use of IoT devices, but sharing that data, sharing data is always challenging, but the IoT devices brought their specific challenges. Uh, such as being a bit more ambiguous when it comes to actual data ownership sometimes, um, GDPR issues when it comes to having locations available of barges, for example, um, security of the devices itself. So we've been taking steps and we've involved a non-project partner here as well, Intertrust, uh, to make the sharing of the, the, device, the data that those devices share more secure and with better governance than it was before. I think, as I mentioned, I'm going to skip, sorry about the whales, but uh, we won't be talking about them today and the icebreakers. But skipping straight to our next steps. Now, as opposed to the previous project, we're not quite finished yet. We're in the final three months of our project. So our first next step is, of course, finishing up by the end of May of this year, where we will also be finalizing our complete recommendations of the project. So I invite you all to follow <coughs> us through our LinkedIn page or our websites for those results. Um, when it comes to the practical implementations of the results, you've noticed that it's a very varied, varied product uh, project with a lot of different partners and a lot of different cases. So when it comes to implementation, of course, it's also very different. Um, some of our more technical partners, they're moving straight to implementation. For example, what's being done on an export platform is available commercially. Um, our Hyperloop partners are expanding their network to cover all of Europe by the end of 2030. No, that's a joke, sorry. <laughs> um, no, they're uh, working on next steps as well. Of course, and they actually, they're right now building their tube at their university, which should be done by the end of the project. I made them promise. Uh, so it's a, it's a broad um, scope of TRA levels that we have within the project, but the overall recommendations are being prepared in the next few months. With that, I hope I managed to stick to my timing and I thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Dimitri. Um, pity, yes, that we couldn't hear about the whales. I, I like that part of the project. But we pass now to the third speaker, uh, Dr. Janko Todorov, for the STORM project. Uh, Janko is a senior scientist and certified project manager at VTT, in the Technical Research Center of Finland, and working in the domain of carbon neutral mobility and transport solution. He specializes in studying how zero emission vehicle fleets are successfully integrated in various operational scenarios. Janko, you have 15 minutes. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Paolo, for the presentation. And it's a pleasure to be a uh, second time in, in, in this forum to present the final result, uh, results from the STORM project. Uh, the STORM project st stands uh, for Smart Freight Transport and Logistics Research Methodologies. We started, ah. we started this project uh, almost three years ago in 2021 and actually ended uh, last, last August. Compared to the other projects that were today presented, this is a relatively small one by funding and relatively small amount of partners. Uh, BTT, the Technical Research Center of Finland was leading this, this project and we had partners from Fraunhofer, Chalmers University in Sweden, Czech Technical University in Prague and Ertico. And actually we were addressing one of the core topics from Horizon, Horizon 2020. And basically the project was uh, focused to identify and screen new data sources, develop new methodologies and tools and generate new, new, case, case, new logistic cases, including latest trends uh, in the area. Uh, we would also have very happy to collaborate with a large group of uh, stakeholders throughout the project. You can see very well known names. Also, we had one, one maybe, uh, let's say hidden stakeholder that was the European Commission. We were very happy to, to collaborate with um, uh, policy officers from DigiMove. And we got uh, kind of like very valuable feedback uh, through developing these uh, different pieces of work uh, throughout the project itself. When it comes to the project objectives, we were focusing on um, uh, six main objectives. Uh, but basically, if we divided on two, two groups, um, on the first, the first part of the project, we we're mostly focused in uh, screening different different trends and challenges in freight and logistics transport, and then identify different analysis needs, <coughs> knowledge gaps that cannot be met by the current models dating three years ago. And then another big portion of work was focused on assessing and existing uh, and, and existing evaluating new sources of data, uh, how to collect the data, process them, analyze them, and which are actually the new types of data in logistics for uh, developing new new tools and innovation. And then, of course, we were also focused on how to create um, synthesized data, mostly uh, considering different available data sources. And we succeeded to uh, publish a couple of uh, uh, open da data uh, sets uh, to meet this objective. Then uh, on the second, second, second row of objectives uh, and kind of like the second half of the project was more uh, focused on elaborating new advanced analysis frameworks, models, needs, um, models and tools to address these identified new needs. And then further on, uh, utilizing those models to, to empower a few use cases that I'm, I'm going to present today. And then further on, kind of like monitor, assess, demonstrate the applications of this data through, through the use cases and provide, of course, recommendations for business policies and, and research. Um, the first use case was focused on uh, designing uh, of uh, EU level heavy heavy duty trucks charging network. Basically, uh, the, the methodology was focused how to identify the long haul uh, truck trips from projected uh, origin destination and uh, annual, annual road transport demand to uh, 2030. And then how to implement a new type of model in order to uh, figure out in which countries uh, there should be a higher density in deploying of charging infrastructure and what to expect in terms uh, needs to be done in the future in terms how to position the charging infrastructure and uh, eventually put some thoughts um, later on to, to support the investment needs in, in different countries. Uh, to solve this, this problem, we have been utilizing uh, open source data that was further enhanced during, during this study, and you can find the link to this open source data uh, in the link in, in the, in the uh, presentation. But what was the main focus here is uh, to identify from the charging infrastructure perspective, uh, the charger type and the number of the chargers per country when it comes to EU. 
and then uh, also figuring out from, um, from the perspective of the locations, the parking areas, the energy consumption, and uh, various, various limitations. But what was the main, uh, the main problem uh, in this area? Uh, our main partners, uh, Fraunhofer and Chalmers, they have, uh, in the beginning of the project, they already have started some, some studies uh, in this area, but what was found out that actually, they're approaching the problems from, the same problem from, from different perspective, and what is the difference, the difference come from, from the limitations and from the assumptions uh, that they've taken. And basically what we further developed in the STORM project itself is developing, enhancing both approaches and developing uh, a new idea called uh, a trip chain approach uh, to further solve some of the limitations of, uh, of the previous methods. And then, uh, as you can see, when it comes to the results, uh, you can see some of the, some of the main results on, on the left side and then on the picture on the right, actually, uh, you can see on the bottom, uh, based on the study, uh, we projected in which countries they should be made higher, higher investments uh, for deployment of uh, charging infrastructure. And we also divided uh, 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 when it comes to the type of the charging, when it comes to the megawatt charging and, and, and uh, slow charging stations. And of course, the density. What you can see actually from the picture is like maybe not surprising for some, for some of us dealing with logistics that the higher concentration in logistic flow is in, in uh, Central Europe and the countries that, that need to put more efforts in investing in charging infrastructure, most, mostly, uh, mostly Ger Germany, Germany, France, and, and, and Benelux area. Then the second case that we've been developing uh, in the project, it was related to uh, city logistics and we've been developing a new approach called virtual piloting for city logistics to support uh, new innovative scenarios. Uh, what, we, what we focused in, in uh, this piece of work, uh, the main aim was to, uh, to create new, new, new use case models and visualize the last, logis logi last mile logistic distribution including new technologies and concepts. And basically our main focus was um, uh, uh, electric mobility and also not focusing only on uh, typical conventional vehicles, but also from future outlook perspective to think uh, a bit uh, in mid and lo long term, uh, what will come beyond the current market technologies and provide a good level to the uh, logistic, uh, city logistic companies to understand actually how they need to deploy the future zero emission fleets and how to build uh, an efficient, uh, new type of profitable and efficient business models with those. And then of course, uh, we try to put some thoughts in uh, how uh, this new type of uh, last mile logistic, logistic uh, uh, scenarios will affect uh, uh, the CO2 emissions. And of course, we demonstrated uh, the application of uh, augmented reality technology uh, to support uh, uh, the thinking in logistic companies, actually what the out how the outcomes of different digital tools that we provide uh, from, from the research perspective, they can really see uh, uh, the value in, in supporting the deployment of different scenarios. What we have done in this virtual piloting, actually we have, we had a couple of uh, settings, one is one located in Finland and one located in Prague. And we were very happy uh, that we were able to get real data from logistics providers, quite rare case. And we were so thankful to the um, national uh, post operator in Finland and a couple of well-known logistic companies like UPS and Liftago <laughs> from the Czech Republic. What we developed uh, in these virtual pilots, basically we utilized different, different virtu virtual tools to replicate in a virtual way current, current scenarios with, with diesel vehicles, then shift them into electric ones, and then some scenarios we develop with a uh, new type of uh, uh, vehicles. As you can see from, from this picture for the case in, in Helsinki, we've been studying how we can switch a typical scenario that nowadays is running with electric vans, and then from future perspective, how these scenarios could be shifted with drones and delivery robots. And then the, the case in, in Prague, how can be shifted from typical uh, uh, diesel van deliveries to electric vans, uh, delivery robots and, and cargo bikes. You can find more information ab about this study on the link below, but I would focus on uh, basically the biggest outcome of, of this research. So what we demonstrated that uh, through the di different digital tools we have, we can 
uh, in, a, in a virtual way, we can study different scenarios with, with all of those vehicles. And what makes, uh, what creates new value for, for, for the logistic business is actually when we evaluate the scenarios in terms of uh, some economical measures and what we did actually here is like providing the total cost of ownership. And that kind of studies, they speak a lot uh, to the companies when they need to especially figure out how to project the cost to invest in new, new type of vehicles, new type of zero emission vehicles, and also to create some shifting plan towards zero, zero emission vehicles in, in mid, mid and long term. And for example, not focusing only on what's available on the market, but a little bit of an insight of the future, like what eventually will make more sense if, if it does not make sense now, for example, what makes sense in, in three to five years or even in longer term. And then, of course, we try to provide also some calculations um, regarding the emission saving potential. So more or less what we try to, to, to showcase here is that how through the different digital tools we have, we can bring real value to logistic companies uh, and support them to, to create shifting plans towards adopting zero mobility in uh, zero emission mobility in a much uh, a shorter period than, than just uh, uh, running uh, the traditional physics pilots that usually takes uh, quite some time and of course resources and investments. And then uh, let's see if I can put the video here. Basically, this is um, a short demo. This is the, the prac one of the practice scenarios. So we utilize the augmented reality uh, visualization because quite often when we propose to the logistics community utilizing various various digital tools there is always a kind of great reluctance towards what we can provide as a value and what kind of scenarios we simulate so that's why uh, here in the storm project we utilize the augmented reality technology as you can see these blue uh, blue vehicles actually are the logistic uh, vans running in uh, around the city inf city infrastructure and uh, more or less kind of like replicating what we have simulated in, 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 uh, in, uh, through, through our, our tools. Let's see if I can stop it. No. Yeah, and, and then uh, moving to uh, the third uh, main outcome of the project, which is related to development of new policies assessment tool. It has been developed by by Fraunhofer, and uh, basically it, it has it had three three main uh, objectives to identify different um, uh, new digitized logistic structures, and uh, then also through utilizing a currently developed tool by Fraunhofer to kind of like project from future perspective which which of the the hyping uh, logistics. Um, uh, logistic concept uh, seems to be viable, more viable in the future when it comes to mi mid and long term and basically to create these two and then of course to empower and make tests. We have been utilizing lots of feedback from, from the logistic community and of course we collected lots of da data during, uh, utilizing surveys. And maybe a little bit on the results. So basically uh, what we, we, what was found out from, from this uh, uh, two, uh, what was simulated that besides the, the big hype uh, uh, towards various different different concepts in logistics, uh, at the moment, uh, what seems to be maybe the way it seems, the way the future seems seems to be heading, uh, it's um, it's more or less everyone believes that maybe the physical internet will be will be the will be the most probable concept when it comes to uh, the longer term, term projections till, till uh, 2015. Uh, you can find more information about this study on, on, on the link below and a bit more information about the, the tool itself and, and the data well, that we have utilized um, in this study. Uh, and then, uh, <coughs> then basically after we developed these uh, three, pieces, uh, three, three pieces of work and three use cases in, in the project, we were focused in providing different recommendations for tra uh, transport uh, planners, business organizations, and, tra and, and policies. Uh, I, won't, I won't go deeper through the differ different points, uh, just kind of like made a made few picks from, from what was found out uh, uh, based on the studies we made and also what we, what we got as a feedback and maybe impression from uh, the different stakeholders' events we've been holding through, throughout the project. 
Um, and then uh, maybe another, uh, another big piece of work is especially when it comes to research and, and, and policy. This list is not, not exhaustive, but uh, we were also very happy by the end of the project, especially the policy part, uh, to, to be able to discuss with um, uh, DigiMove uh, Digi policy officers. But more or less, this is from, from my side. Quickly, by the end of it, what we uh, have done in the project, we produced a so-called project toolbox. Uh, the website is still live, and basically you can find uh, all the tools, links to some of the tools uh, we have utilized uh, can be freely downloaded. Uh, you can find also links to the data sets we have produced and then different project reports, um, all the papers actually, uh, uh, that kind of give a little bit more research insight on, on the developments we've made in the project, the use cases. And, and of course, uh, if someone's interested in the webinars that, that we've been holding with a uh, big group of uh, stakeholders throughout the whole project, despite the corona situation. So everything is there, so feel free to, to, to check the information. But more or less, that's from my side. Thank you, Janko, for, uh, for all the um, modeling and uh, very interesting video. Um, for speaker, Georgia. Um, so, Dr. Georgia Ifantopoulou for the Four Freight Project. Um, and Georgia is research director at the Hellenic Institute of Transport of CHERS. And she has an experience of 25 years in transport system planning, management, and optimization. Um, she has a focus on technology implementations and their work emphasizes ITS, big data analytics, um, modeling decision support. And Georgia is also a member of the um, Digital Transport and Logistics Forum, so one of our experts. Georgia, the floor is yours. Paula for introducing me. Uh, I'm really happy to be here with you. As you, you heard, I'm old woman, so old in logistics, old in mobility. And a lot of the discussions we have today and also some of those that are take place in our four freight projects that I have the honor to coordinate are really old problems and we try to find uh, 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 common solutions, hopefully. So for freight stands for flexible, uh, multimodal and robust freight transport and um, 18 partners from research, a lot from uh, global actors, also for smaller operators in the logistics, uh, technology providers, they came together in order to, to give sufficient answer to what we was the request for more efficient and effective multimodal freight transport nodes to increase flexibility, service visibility, and reduce the average cost of uh, freight transport. So nodal points along the net, the the the, um, uh, the 10T was the main uh, focus of our um, of our uh, of our work. Um, what we try to do is to maximize the utilization of the multimodal freight transport capacity and uh, achieve these objectives that we have. And we work now for one year and a few months. So we are at the beginning of our uh, uh, project life. We have 40 months uh, to conclude our project, 30 something uh, from now. Uh, and um, we, we want to do this by providing novel solutions, which however, they will interoperate with the current legacy logistic systems. We know, and this is our belief, that there are already investments by the big players, and also there are a lot of investments that are nodal points for managing infrastructure, for managing operation in ports in airports. So we try to find solutions that can add um, efficiency to intermodal interface between the different modes. And while we want to do this, uh, we promise and we look for uh, real-time door-to-door tracking, so data and the discussion of how the data, where we can find the data and um, how this data can provide us the full uh, monitoring of the, of, the, of the change of mode in the nodal point is one of our uh, uh, objectives and we work there on technology and IoT and new sensors and also we are testing if sensors they need to be positioned in different uh, uh, positions of the tracks or of the rail in order to have the information we want. We want to increase the sustainability. Uh, that means that we try uh, all the projects before they spoke about the optima. 
and we will also speak about this. So algorithms optimization, but here the different thing that we do in in in, uh, in for freight probably is that we try to merge the different views of the different actors. What is optimum as a process for moving a cargo from a port to the airport? Uh, pushing a cargo and then receiving the cargo by the airport, these actors, they don't have the similar uh, priorities, they don't have similar uh, optimization needs. So we want to bring them all together under this objective of increased sustainability in order to reduce also the environmental impact since nodal points and these terminals usually are near to urban areas. Um, we want to also to increase resilience so this is one of the pillars of our work. So we try to see how the novel solutions and the interoperation between the different modal uh, terminals in our nodal points, they can also prepare this network overall in order to face efficiently the disruptive events. And um, finally, finally, of course, optimization and res of resources utilization. I think everybody working on digitization and logistics is trying to do this in, uh, in, our, uh, in our projects. Now, how we will do that? So, first of all, we try to identify what it is this multimodal transport and logistics use cases. What are the real problems? Do we have a list in Europe of all the typical intermodal interface problems at nodal points? So, what is the thing we are looking for? Saving time, for making uh, uh, quicker, for uh, for making less environmental. But we need a list of typical problems that all the nodal points they face. And this is what we are working and this is where we have really results in, in our first year of the project. And then we try to identify interoperable solutions. Uh, we call them solvers and I will come again to that in order to face these uh, this, this, uh, uh, problems. And uh, we, we do that uh, by learning from real life uh, multi-stakeholder logistics management. You know, a port, the port of Piraeus and the airport of Athens, although they are collaborating, they say they use the same term for an operation, a logistics operation, but they don't mean really the same thing. So we need to bring them together and to understand and to agree on what are the data related with this activity. And so not only interoperability of systems, of technologies, but also interoperation, interoperability of their processes, what they are doing in logistics. The other thing that we're doing is uh, we work a lot on these novel business models and collaborative approaches. So we spoke about translation, about TIC 4.0 standardization. This will never happen if they don't come together and agree in that. So a collaboration is the enabling process for making the solutions to be part of the of the of their uh, of of this digitization that we want for efficiency and re reduced cost and CO2. And finally, um, the compatibility with existing logistic standards. This is not a project for standardization. The Costco, that is a partner, DHL, they have their own systems, legacy systems. They comply to, um, to, to standards or whatever. They use this one. What we want to do is to see how we will translate the, net, the data that are needed, of course, not being a central, but, but all federated in this data. Each one, they keep their data, how they can be translated in a way that the other part can, um, uh, can identify the, what, what is needed. So standardization of multimodal and multi-stakeholder end-to-end freight management is the solution that we try to identify. Do we have results? Okay, first of all, we have three, three sites. You see, we have um, the river port to rail interface in Romania. This is the Galati port. It's a small river port uh, um, that tries that increases a lot and wants to be to have interface with rail. And rail infrastructure is poor and there is a prob problem there. Uh, and there we have a, shipping, a river shipping company which is very advanced. They have their own system, so we need to see how they can come together with the terminal operators in order to find the solution to achieve this uh, rail, uh, rail usage. Then we have Valencia, where it's quite, we try to, the long haulage to be um, um, uh, interfaced at this nodal point of Valencia with the last mile. So we have Costco, Costco uh, goods, they go to DHL uh, warehouses and from DHL we want to reach the, the final destination through the metro Valencia. So how 
what is the information we need to exchange, how these goods, they can be uh, in, in overall optimization and then use the train to go from the port to the DHL and use the metro for the last uh, point. So we do what I said before, analyze, we analyze and generalize the real operational cases and we try to identify the list of real pro problems and we try to see how these uh, real inter problems in the model interface can be solved. And um, um, uh, we also explore needs of emerging intermodality using new capacities that I mentioned already the subways based network of uh, Valencia being used and the airport and seaport in Greece, the Piraeus port uh, very advanced technologically and the Athens airport very advanced technologically. They want to see how the cargo will go through the, uh, the agglomeration of Athens creating less CO2 but also how it will arrive at the time that is necessary for optimizing the schedule, the internal schedule of the warehouse of the airport. So the, the, the port wants to, f to send it while the, the airport wants to be, let's say, in, on, a, on a buffer until the moment they will, be, they will be used for their own optimization. So what we have, we have this comprehensive technology driven uh, solvers library. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, are, we are developing our own. We have a list of 50 solvers. Now we have the solutions under development for the 21 of them. Uh, each one is associated with the, with the problem solving. And, um, and they can be technology, they can be an AI model, they can be a CO2 footprint calculator. They can be different things around. We are working on, on grouping this um, and, and making categorization. And then we have this uh, platform, the for freight platform, which is the intermodal operation decision support system architecture. What is this? So we want everyone who has a problem at a nodal point, an intermodal interface problem, to come in our platform, identify what is its own category, and then by selecting the this, this specific interface, uh, find um, uh, using uh, uh, invoke solvers in order to, sol to solve its own problem. So it's like uh, uh, we build the knowledge in order to select uh, the solver that is needed for their own problem. And as I said, we don't develop everything. We also use uh, uh, solvers outside. So the for freight platform, it will manage the integration and development of solvers. It will monitoring the efficient layers of components that are needed there in order to, to have creation. They will manage the information flow through the different use cases, will provide access to the different solvers, and will provide, of course, authorization to those that they need. We see in our use cases that some of the solvers the big players, they want to integrate in their systems. It's fine with us, but they will be there, build it, made available for others to, be, to, to use them. Uh, then we have uh, what, we, what I call uh, setting a common ground for logistic communication there. As I said, we don't have big objectives of standardization. However, we use uh, the TIC 4.0 um, uh, translation model in order to interface it. They started, this is the ecosystem approach. So this TIC 4.0 started from the Valencia ecosystem port, and now we, we migrate it and we see how it can be achieved in order to have the airport of uh, same vocabulary, same semantics with um, airlines and other actors that are in our uh, system. Also, we enhance logistics operation by leveraging real-time data for sensors. There, there is a work that probably will reach to patent, patent to, to have a patent there, uh, in order to see uh, how we can monitor integrate it, the new unitized uh, um, cargo unitization uh, systems that we use for the, for the metro. Um, and finally, I can probably say the seven result, which is the intermodal interface resilient simulation and digital twin. I don't think that we really have a digital twin for resilient for for simulating the resilience and assessing the resilience of intermodal interface. So there we work, and we are very happy that we work. Cert uh, is working there with uh, with uh, uh, Costco and uh, DHL in order to 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 uh, to identify what exactly is the digital twin infrastructure that we need. There and how we can, um, we can make this uh, use of a tool at the end as a solver, uh, um, as a digital tool, as a service, let's say, in order to facilitate, to assess the resilience of the different interfaces. 
Now, what we also do, we try to learn from others. Our knowledge process is we try to see what the others are doing. So here you see that we work with uh, a word, multi-layer load. We have a lot uh, and we are very thankful to Alice that opens the door also for other projects in order to see what they are doing. Because as I said, we don't want to develop everything. We want to be ready for provide efficiency to the legacy systems that already exist and that we don't want to change. Um, now, this is the list of the medium-term impacts. I put it there because we are far away from uh, reaching them, although through simulation, our solvers, they saw, they, they saw that there are good, that we're going to have good results. But here is uh, what we are expecting for each one of the cases. And these are big numbers. And uh, what, we, what is our objective is not to have the 20% in, uh, in, uh, in, in Galati port and missing it in, uh, in the Valencia port, on having Valencia port in 60%, in etc. What we try is to achieve the objectives in the model environment and operation of different technological and infrastructure maturity. And indeed, we have three cases that we have really different situations, and we cannot avoid thinking of the particular situations in the nodal points of Europe and having probably global solutions. Um, then the medium term results is to achieve the, um, the confirmed impacts of the supply chain actors' operations being guided by global players and local actors. The solutions are not ready for everybody. And not everybody is ready for taking a good innovative solution. So the readiness of the ecosystems there of the supply chain is not the same. So we need to, to, to make our solutions available to big players and to local actors in smaller, smaller operators that very, are very important for operation of the nodal points and for the sustainable and efficient operation of the nodal points uh, and see what are the particularities and what, what additional we need to offer probably to local actors. The long-term um, impacts in order to close is um, uh, upgrade in the, the, in the resilient physical and digital infrastructure for clean, accessible and affordable and connected nodal points. Uh, here we look for, for adopting any, any, any solver that exists in the platform or being federated with other platforms. We, expect, we don't expect to be the only in the world. Um, then, um, uh, especially about the sustainability and how you join the different points of view of, optima of the optimization of the different actors, uh, there our intermodal interface and digital twin uh, and as a service, if we achieve at the end to have it as a service, as a, as a service in our platform, as a solver, that would be uh, uh, good to, 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 to achieve this, uh, this, uh, these figures. And finally, the community-based standardization uh, and uh, the TIC 4.0 new semantic for different for other months is what we are expecting and we are promising. Thank you very much. Thank you, Georgia. I mean, all very disciplined speakers, perfectly, sorry, 15 sorry. minutes. Um, now we open the question uh, session uh, and I pass the floor to Fernando that will manage this session. Thank you. Thank you, Paola, for, for the introduction and thank you for all the, the speakers for your your presentations and uh, thank you, Xavier and Ertrak and Sikam and Two Zero for inviting us uh, to moderate this this session on the digitalization of of logistics. Uh, before going into the into the questions part, uh, I'll like to do a, a, a short briefing of what we have seen here. Uh, f first thing is that uh, we have seen three projects that are at the end and while another project is at the midterm and then we can we can see this uh, difference in terms of the of the results this is uh, obvious uh, but I would like to first reflect also that uh, both planet and epicenter were coming starting in 2020 meaning the calls were there or pro proposals prepared in 2019 and uh, the topics were there 2018 so it's already like six seven years ago where these uh, uh, research projects were there so then now everybody speaks about artificial intelligence digital twins uh, physical internet road transport automation but i think epicenter maybe was one of the first european projects that put automation of road transportation as part of the scope. 
maybe I'm mistaken, but uh, I, I think it's probably one of the first ones. So then I, I think uh, in that, uh, in that uh, sense, uh, uh, we have seen during these years a lot of progress with the implementation of FT, the European Free Transport Information and the FT regulation that will be in place in 2016. So then in 2026, uh, sorry. So then these projects are really supporting the development at, at policy level and getting good uh, grounds how to reach this uh, digitalization of uh, logistics making it possible to create visibility in end-to-end -end logistics chains, connecting the different transportation modes. And then we have seen, once we have that, uh, we can then lever a lot of value in terms of utilization of resources, visibility, increased resiliency in supply chains and logistics. And these are the main advances of these uh, projects, really demonstrating putting more examples, use cases uh, forward. Once we have those systems digitalized, what we can do better and in a moment in time deal will be a return investment. So then everything will start uh, moving around as uh, also Janscher said, uh, towards this concept of the, of the physical internet that is still long-term. We are there, but uh, we are creating through all these projects, the, the building blocks, uh, on that, uh, particularly on, on a storm, I think uh, they, they also created uh, a good basis on one of the most important or challenging problems now. It's where we place charging, how we get charging for our uh, electric uh, trucks. Uh, now we are in new projects, CFS, and we are really uh, struggling to find uh, charging points for demonstrations. And we need to act very fast to achieve the objectives that are set uh, by 2030, 45% reduction of emissions in the fleet's sales, which is a big, big challenge uh, considering we don't have infrastructure and hopefully uh, we, can, we can move uh, fast. And this will see happening. And I think uh, all these projects uh, getting these insights on charging infrastructure network are very, very relevant as the concept or the case you made in Prague and Helsinki to demonstrate how uh, for last mile uh, TCO it's okay, it's very good now. So then transition in the fleets may happen today or tomorrow. So last uh, but not least, uh, uh, I think the focus of uh, for freight, it's more on, on the view of the, the role of logistics nodes in the whole ecosystem and how they can build interconnectivity and how they can also play a good role in getting better utilization of the assets and resources in the in the nodes. And I see it's a, a work, work in progress uh, here. And now with uh, with this uh, i would like uh, to open the door for your questions i i need to tell you that uh, we um, we are expecting for questions um, rather than comments so then if you have comments if you want to uh, discuss particular things uh, we can do but uh, please it's better you place your questions or the discussion points you want to raise rather than to make a, a whole a new presentation. And second uh, is that uh, please uh, tell your name and your affiliation so we, we all know. So then I see one hand there at the end. Uh, so this is for you. No, no, no. Oh, thank you for the presentations. My name is Michael Glotzrichter from the city of Bremen, so coming from the city and also being coordinator of the ULATS project on urban logistics. I have three questions, or more or less two questions. First, um, to the first presentations, when we hear about digitalization and especially seeing the routes from China to Europe, uh, through Russia or through the Red Sea, I missed a little bit uh, some risk assessment of all the processes. Um, what about uh, security, cyber attacks, and, and things like this? So 
um, I think this is a very current uh, hot topic. That's number one. And the other point now, uh, from the viewpoint of a city and the ULATS project, which will be presented tomorrow by Howard, um, we have two resources uh, that are short. And hearing about uh, charging points, hearing about last mile logistics, who pays for it? What's the business case and what's expected from municipalities or the public sector? That's a little bit missing. I mean, it's, it's a bubble and we have to really see the link to municipality who pays for it. And the second resource that's limited is space. And that's such a hot topic in all of our cities. When you want to do micro hubs, when you want to do uh, delivery zones, it all requires space. And when you want to change private car parking into whatever it is, this is a barrel of dynamite in, in, in our, um, let's say, local policy making. And I would like to hear some more words about this as well. Thank you so much. Okay, perfect. Maybe, Thomas, you can address the first one. One, two. Yeah. The first one for cyber attacks, it's a very good point. These were not relevant that much in 2018 when Fiona pointed out when Planet was in the making. It's a lot more relevant after the war, you know, unfortunately. So it's also an agenda of Inlecom that I represent today here. And we are looking at the cybersecurity issues as well. I completely agree with you. But back in 2018, it was not as pronounced as it is today. But with digitalization, with more federations and cross-connectivity and interoperability and harmonization, all these beautiful words, people forget about cybersecurity. For me, that's something that needs to be put on the agenda as well. So that, that's a very good point. It was not included per se in uh, Planet, but there were some attempts to actually assess the cybersecurity elements. For urban logistics in the last mile, if you listen to uh, Torsten Klimke in the, in the plenary session, besides having TNT quarters, you will have also the nodes which are going to be subject to SALPs, huh? sustainable, sustainable, sustainable Urban Logistics Plans. So far you have SALPs, but for SALPs, you don't really have anything tangible yet that the companies can follow. I was before involved in projects with the city of Kent and so on, and they are developing their own SOPs as well. In terms of space and space management, you can create digital solutions which actually can connect to a solution called back then that was DAC, Dynamic Access Controller, which means that you can actually cooperate with police departments and also with the LSPs and also with the city authorities and you can manage the space and you can give them extra incentives such as uh, extra time windows to enter the city because you have also um, car emission free zones as well or car free zones in a lot of cities in Belgium. So for this, you will also need cyber security features, especially if these uh, solutions are implemented. And that's it from my side. I'm not sure if any others. It's okay. I think Georgia wanted to add something. I don't know the answer. Yeah. If Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to mention another typology of risks and Planet took that because I, I was part of, uh, I was in, in the consortium of Planet. Uh, so, in fact, uh, there is also another risk when the economy changes, when the trades change and when the corridors change importance. What do we do as Europe with the infrastructure we have there and how we, we adapt to the new situation and, in fact, uh, what the um, and and actually this is a period uh, the globalization is finishing and the regionalization is opening so the Europe network needs to, to change to be able to to serve also for for uh, for export except of import that we have now so this type of risks they need also simulation there is models in order to be assessed and in order to have sufficient answers and planet uh, has provided this type of strategic planning now planning is also very much important for the level of the of the cities and of the nodal points because what we see there is that logistics and mobility industry is improvising they are coming they're giving answers to their solutions and the cities there stay there looking how to manage the space we are on a shortage of space in of urban space so therefore we need and part of sustainable urban logistics plans we need plans that use that makes us to see how the technology can make uh, efficient management of the space and uh, and also we need 
to be in a position in the cities to quantify what are their needs, how many shared vehicles we need, how many shared bikes we need, how many uh, infrastructure for charging we need. Thank you, Georgia. This is not for free. It's your experience, uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, it's very good that we have that in the in the panel. Andreas. Thank you. Andreas Storder from the Austrian Ministry for Climate Protection, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation, Technology. Um, several of your projects are covering not only the aspect of going digital, but as well going green by electrification of the vehicles. Now, it was common sense for many years that uh, batteries are more suited for smaller uh, vehicles and short distances and that heavier vehicles and long distances are more suited uh, with fuel cells. So my question, on the other side, in the last years, uh, batteries had a tremendous advancements. So my question is uh, concerning different applications and range. Do you see, which, which role do you see for batteries and for fuel cells? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, maybe. I'll go first. I'm certainly not an expert on this, but indeed this is one of the fields where we saw a large shift between the start of the project, I think, and now. And when you mean fuel cells, I assume you mean hydrogen fuel cells. Yeah. So what I've seen is more of a move towards batteries for road transport and away from hydrogen fuel cells um, in part because the consensus seems to be that we'll need it elsewhere where it has more of an added value like maritime transport. Um, so that's what I've seen and I think that so consolidation is happening for trucks as well. But oh, uh, Ambra, uh, Thomas also wanted to answer so perhaps he has something to add to that as well. Unless you're finished, I don't know. I'm finished. Yep. For batteries, if you have a look at the logistic system and if we incorporate batteries you also create another level, another level of complexity so if you create traveling salesman problems and whatever and you develop algorithms and routing ones which also companies use in their systems with batteries you also need to adjust and reconfigure that routing because it needs to be charged somewhere so therefore instead of having destinations or distribution centers you need to incorporate the distances to the to the charging stations and that can also cause deviations as well so that's why it's an extra level of complexity that the systems are not uh having yet i know in 2019 there was a colleague who did actually a phd on road routing incorporating the battery lifetime and also the location allocation models for battery charging stations as well so it's happening and I know also some companies, I think it was Audi developed develop these kind of things as well. So for for freight, not that one, but for freight, uh, not the project, that also means that if you have heavy batteries in vehicles, that's also extra weight as well. So trucks are also not developed, especially freight trucks are not developed to be carrying batteries. They are developed to be carrying pallets and any kind of goods. So for me, the extra complexity is routing because you cannot just charge everywhere. So there's the infrastructure and how you route to, throughout that infrastructure and also the weight dimensions as well, because you need to be able to have lighter batteries, which are also more efficient. And the question is also how, how do you get the raw materials for those uh, batteries that actually need to operate? And it's also a cross model issue, not only for trucks, but they're developing that also for barges for instance which is also a problem there but do you want to say that fuel cells are better in this case or can you repeat that fuel cells yeah. because i mean when you are arguing against batteries do you mean uh, that fuel cells are better because i mean it, it depends electrification is going on i mean yeah all your your comments are correct but nevertheless it will come so yeah the question is it's fuel cells or it's there needs batteries. to be a commitment from companies and the commission and from the government as well number one is what we i learned from my previous 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 job is that if you have a transition from one system to another so from uh, petrol and gasoline towards electric you need to choose if you want hydrogen or if you not want other things as well because if you start investing into different baskets you kind of miss the opportunity 
to have this acceleration faster which means that if you decide to go for batteries and electric go for it and th that that's the change which is happening now you see it also in belgium especially all company cars are electric now so the market is there the trucks are also gaining slowly with volvo and so on for instance so it should be electric but then you have toyota saying that we're not going to invest fully into electric we're going to stick to our hybrids as well because you have some issues around electric so i'm not vouching towards um, the opposition for electric i'm saying if we have electric vehicles we should carry on but sometimes if you invest or focus on different segments you might think okay the infrastructure is not there let's invest our money and efforts towards that infrastructure rather than discussing different things as well but hydrogen and electric are the two main front runners i would say yeah i i think you Yes, I just wanted to, to support what, what Thomas said, that basically electric and, and, and hydrogen are the both, the, both, the both propulsion technologies that will go further. But my personal feeling is like we, we started to the road towards electrification in, in this long haul logistics because we know batteries and we know, we know the grid systems. So it was kind of easy to onboard that, that kind of solutions in order to, to alleviate the climate crisis. Then when it comes to, to uh, utilizing hydrogen, there is still lots of open questions. We don't have established uh, value chains, how the hydrogen will be produced, stored, and then utilized and, and whatsoever. I see it maybe some, this is something that will come in the forthcoming years, but in and, and some area there is still a lot of research to be done in a way. In the meantime, batteries are picking speed, battery electric vehicles are picking speed. And, and this is something that we should, should, should consider. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to, to the user perspective, many companies, they're still agnostic towards batteries when it comes to long haul freight, and they're a little bit waiting to see which technology will, will, will prevail. But on the other hand, we have like a very clear targets that we need to somehow meet if you want to solve the climate crisis. And I think we should take one step at a time, which is more mature as technology at the moment to start with. One, one more sentence, if I may. The grid is an issue as well for, for electric and batteries. If you don't have the grid, you can have a lot of nice cars which are electric, but if the grid is not adjusted, you will have bottlenecks there as well. Speaking from my wife's perspective, who's the energy reg regulator, and she sees exactly what's happening. So the grid is an issue as well, uh, especially when you have RES systems, the wind turbines coming from the sea, you cannot really squeeze the electricity and energy towards the shore. Uh, so the grid needs to be adjusted to accommodate not only trucks but also the big electric vehicles and freight vehicles as well i, I think you're yeah wants to add something yeah uh, one comment first of all regarding the infrastructure you know that now we have the safe and secure parkings there's an initiative of eu and all the countries they developing safe and secure parkings and in accordance to the regulation the eu regulation and these safe and secure parkings are longer than this um, we're going to have uh, uh, charging stations for uh, also for electric um, uh, um, trucks or whatever it will become there. Now, what I, I dependently of the discussion, if the grid is, is, is ready or whatever, I think uh, um, changing the technology, we need to take into account the economic impact to the operation of the actors. So for changing such and such in hydrogen or electric um, uh, uh, freight, uh, 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 car for freight, uh, is something that is going to change a lot, a lot, a lot the cost uh, of the operations of the, of, the, of the industry and probably the, the competitiveness of the, of the freight industry because we depend in Europe very much on, uh, on roads. So I think we need to take this consideration also. But in any case, for urban freight, we need to move quickly to electric. Very good. In these moments is when I would prefer to have the less comfortable uh, place as panelists rather than to be uh, a moderator. But uh, I could say that uh, there are three projects uh, uh, funded uh, under 2.0 program called CFS Escalate and Empower that are actually working on, on all these uh, elements in different use cases. And I think they will have a turn to present in this conference next year. So uh, 
but meantime, if you want, uh, they they will be all present in in TRA, so then you can visit a session. It's organized special session on those projects and on this. So then, uh, if you do, cannot wait the next year this conference, uh, you you may go there, and and get also a lot of uh, results on, uh, that are there from those projects. Are there more questions from the audience? Yes. Hello. Uh, my name is Katerina Deliali and I'm from Sinea. I have a question that pretty much uh, Thomas touched on his presentation, but I was wondering how do you see uh, large language models in freight and logistics because this is the next thing coming, of course, after batteries, after electrification. Uh, but I would also like to hear the perspective both from industry side, but also the researchers and how do you see the role of each one in this development? Thank you. You understood? It's, uh, you mean uh, large language? Uh, yeah, if you could clarify what you mean. Usually. Okay, large language model is ChatGPT. Yes. I want to use this term instead of AI because many people come with a regression model and claim this is AI and it's not. And, you know, we need to be very clear what are we talking about, otherwise, <laughs> other people will do this development. And generally, I'm very much in favor because I keep and keep reading how much profit is generating for companies the use of. AI and digitalization, and it's something that has to be considered, you know, following the correct term and the correct development. Should I start? Yeah. For this, uh, for these large language models, um, before I joined Inlacom, I was working for Alice, it's been on the nose uh, four days ago. So that means that we also uh, launched a white paper on artificial intelligence. And these were specific cases coming from ports, networks, and so on. They, and they used a lot of solutions which were proprietary. So they were not really coming from European projects, but most of them are really funded by their own organizations. And we also received afterwards when we published it, what would be the role of these uh, large language models? This is a very good question because I think it's also ne the next step. And we also met at the Keystone project as well because I think you're the PO there. And what's very good is that at that Keystone project, the people actually listened to previous solutions which had been developed also within the ETLF from Phoenix and Federated and so on. So this is for me very crucial. and. When it comes to when I mentioned the converters, uh, if you want to actually get one standard, which can come potentially from DCSA towards TIG 4.0 or the other way around, it, what's happening already is that TIG 4.0 can interpret what's being sent through DCSA. So it's actually a data format. You send it from DCSA to TIG 4.0, but it doesn't work the other way around because they don't have that solution developed for the for the return flow of the information. and these converters can be actually assessed and connected through these large uh, language models as well because all the time you need people to say okay this id 5 means what then this uh, minus 70 means that it's minus 70 hours of lead time or does it mean that that's the that's the temperature at which i need to have my vaccine so the, the interpretation of the number is very vague and therefore you have data formats and these come in different uh, layers and for these converters it's crucial to understand because you have a lot of uh, platforms and federations and everybody talks about interoperability but nobody talks about harmonization so if you need to harmonize all of these you need somebody to, to convert these data formats into a readable format of the other party so if you use these large data models that, that can be actually this kind of facilitator that you convert that automatically, you save also a lot of time, a lot of manpower to do so. So for me, it's a very big next step, which can really ease the work, 
but I would not rely solely on that because we still need uh, people in the loop as well. Otherwise, it can be producing a lot of gibberish. But for sure, something to explore. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what he said. So I believe uh, the, the converters, the creation of these converters of translators that make takes the data and then they translate them and they make the smart translation in order the the next tool to to to, to be taken and to take to take is, is the the area where the, we we're going to see this type of of, uh, um, of applications. I would also say that uh, I also see that the domain of um, I mentioned is what we try to do in for freight is um, the, the the standardization of operations. So what we mean by receiving, what we mean by by by. by and let's say by clearing up the goods in order to go for the warehouse, etc. So between the different modes and also even between operators in the same mode. This does not mean the, the meaning is not the same. So they are also, uh, uh, um, let's say, harmonizing this knowledge uh, and creating common knowledge is, is very good. So I see a lot of applicability in common knowledge creation, which means we need to have the knowledge to make it available because GTP is, is based, based on, on knowledge that somebody made available. Huh? So we, we need to continue to experiment and we need to continue to, to make research, etc. But I would like also to, to make a comment on AI. We speak a lot about the term of AI. In logistics, we don't have so much AI. As you correctly said, just training a model on data which are difficultly made available. So you don't have the really better fit on AI model. So we say AI by saying that we want to be to make smart, smart matching, smart, intelligent uh, use of, of, of the of the capacities. And we have OR methods, operational research methods. Yes, this is happening and has a lot of, of, of potential. It will continue to have it. Um, but I think we will survive with these two things. Not really AI, but and also very, very focused application of the such GPT methods and techniques for the next uh, 10 years in logistics. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that I, I wish that you it, you will be uh, correct. <laughs> it's it's a pity we don't have coffee break uh, later. It's too late today, but uh, you can uh, you can keep it for for tomorrow for sure. Yeah, at, at the end, I, I think it's a very, very good, very fair question. This was one of the topics we tried to put forward uh, in Alice like four or five years ago. Yeah. But at that moment, uh, focus was more on, on pure standardization and data models uh, uh, instead of uh, learning models or large. Uh, but uh, this probably will come uh, one of these years, uh, hopefully. So uh, additional questions? There, yeah, you. Uh, my name is John von Stamm, FIR at RWTH Aachen University. So um, a few of the projects mentioned the potential of blockchains and smart contracts. I know from Thomas, um, he mentioned that as a call for action. Um, yeah, after the failure of trade lens, uh, what is what we can learn from that and what should uh, future projects in this field maybe adhere to? That's an excellent question. How much time do I have for this? <laughs> 15 minutes. I know. Briefly, I think this is why we need a physical internet. Because trade lens went belly up, as they call it, because it was a cooperation of quite big players, namely IBM and Maersk. Even though it saved a lot of money and it was sufficient, if you have DCSA members like MSC, CMAC, GM, Zim, One, and so on, the biggest shipping lines, they didn't really want to rely and put their eggs into the basket of IBM. Some people and some system architects, I'm not sure if I can say it here, but they said like trusting IBM is like trusting a pedophile in, in a daycare. So for them, from a system architecture perspective, it's not so good to have vendor locking. And if you have vendor locking, such as IBM, you will not be able to create standards which are technology neutral or vendor neutral, vendor neutral. 
And that's why DCSA is also working towards open standards, which are not, which are actually technology neutral standards. And that's also what a physical instance should be built on, on the open connectivity and the open standards as well. So you create standards which are technology neutral and vendor neutral, and then you will decide if you use Azure for this, Google for this, AMS, Amazon for this, but you have neutral standards so that you don't have a solution which is developed by IBM and Maersk. So for me, the blockchain is also more about the openness, which also builds on the principles of number one, the physical internet, but also number two is following the principles of DTLF as well, which is then the FT, which is then the EMDS, which is the European Mobility Data Space as well. So for me, that's the way, and that's why it failed. And we also had a lot of inputs when I attended the IPCSA event in Barcelona. They also talked about this issue as well. And they all agreed that for, for cooperation, we need not one solution where you create a winner takes it all situation, which was actually IBM and Maersk, and you need to be more decentralized. And that's why also the European Commission is promoting more the federation way of working with platforms as well, rather than having one single reference point uh, governed by a few. If, if I may, as I don't want to be blamed because this is a road conference and we are talking about uh, sipping, but uh, I would say that these uh, elements are very important or relevant for road transportation when we are developing infrastructure for charging. We are developing solutions on how to book uh, charging or how to organize those charging uh, slots and how to create those uh, platforms of different uh, vendors for, for charging. So I, I think this is a very good learning. I was astonished myself when Maersk was creating Digital Container Shipping Association that was the one creating the open standards for the whole shipping industry while they were the ones taking trade lanes. But then after a few years, uh, probably they wanted to, to buy into things, open standards or we win all and they realized maybe a second one could uh, make the business case even better. So that's, uh, but it, it was astonishing for me for a few years until uh, the outcome uh, reached out. More questions? No, I have uh, a couple for 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 the for the speakers. Uh, maybe we start with you, Thomas, because I was really impressed uh, with the results of the impacts out of your uh, living labs. Of course, these are research conditions, and this is what you can get when you implement things, but uh, how to move from those uh, results to uh, get those happening in practice in the in the market? Because something that we realize is that some, uh, in living labs, you have very controlled uh, conditions. It's not uh, market operations. It's not uh, really a production side. So then how, how to move from those results to, to actual implementation, getting those outcomes in, in practice? Yep. Here I have three short points. Uh, in living lab number two, when I showed you the, the customs management system, it was a living lab, but it got also implemented under the key connect, which means that here my message would be to start with real problems. It was a real problem. There was a big bottleneck, a lot of paper documents. So if you actually use uh, the digitalization for the e-customs and so on, that's something that can be streamlined, which also was. And that also means that if you develop solutions, the problem should come first and then the solution afterwards. I've noticed a lot of companies and a lot of projects, they develop the solution first and then they chase the problem. And they ask, what can we solve with this? Nothing. So problem first, then the solution, that's crucial. And that's also what ensures an uptake of those solutions and uh, potential implementation once you have real end users interested in this. That being said, um, what I've noticed, R&D or R&I solutions, they also need to have kind of a co-creation with system architects and software developers. Because if you have only researchers and only universities working on these projects, and there's nobody to actually connect the dots and build a bridge between the industry and the solution in the R&D sector, 
then you do not really have any kind of implementation or scale up. So working with, and Inlecom also does that with, for instance, Connecta and so on, we work closely with the system architects. And if we say, is this blue going to work? And they say, no, 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 you need the connectors, this, you need this. So basically what you need is something which brings you to the ground and which tells you, okay, you're too much in the, in, in, in your, in, with your head in the clouds. You need to really uh, make it more executable. And number three is that the, the processes that you use in real life, these actual processes are also subject to change. What does this mean? It means that with the upcoming FT, for instance, you will have a lot more data generated and captured by FT uh, platforms, FT gateways, and so on. So if you also work on projects which involve ECMR already, and FT can be seen as an e ECMR 2.0, you also have to work on future proof solutions, which are, for instance, FT compliant. So do not just like be proactive, uh, sorry, do not be reactive, but try to be more proactive, seeing what the European Commission and DG Move try, are trying to do with ETLF and try to also work towards that goal with them in parallel. So having use cases, having application domains and trying to kind of connect the dots as well by being future proof and look at what's happening at the Data Governance Act data act ai act as well which is there as well so these are things that are going to pop up and that's also where the money is going to be flowing as well perfect thank you i i don't know if there are questions i i have one for dimitris that has not talked to, to so much in the in the questions but i i'm particularly curious because you have uh, work on this uh road automation uh, use case uh, in epicenter for for long if you could share a little bit more out on on the results and how this use case has evolved since you started working on on this to what's now the end of the of the project so then you mentioned the evolution of uh, uh, battery electric uh, is where it's much more prominent now that uh, hydrogen but with automation could you share your reflections on that or what uh, the main learnings and outcomes you got to an extent i can yeah. um yeah i think the the case with einright and the automation it was one of the funniest when it came to the partners because i think they started out with a company of like 30 people and they're now counting into the hundreds all across the world so the company in itself grew and and things sped up a lot with that growth as well when it came to what they're able to do now <clears throat> in the case specifically the case on the innovation part is mostly about pots um, today it's one of the few cases in the project next to hyperloop where Often when you're talking about digitalization, the, the message will be the technology is there. It's just, for example, getting the data or getting it used properly. Here, they're still really also working on the technology. I think we all know that self-driving isn't quite where Elon Musk said it would be today. Um, this comes to personal transport, but also in especially in the extra risk that's involved with, with transporting freight. So their pods, they are being used in practice today, but in very enclosed spaces. And their end goal is of course, being able to work flexibly on open roads. But the test that they did now is really working together with it. The site at Astra Zero at phase one was about setting it up so that they could start moving towards more open spaces, not just the enclosed. A good example I always use because it's where I work is for example the port area in antwerp is actually quite simple it's one road which connects a lot of terminals which has a lot of potential i think for using that kind of automation because the complexity is relatively low so that's really what they were working on on, on getting that step done um, in this phase and also going a bit faster um, because the capabilities are there for a lot of speed i think an interesting movie to look is that they have one where their pod does the the test track of Top Gear, but again, that's a very controlled environment. So getting away from that control. Um, and that of course was phase one, was very practical. I think the main thing that they learned from that is their need for a digital simulation environment, which is why initially within the project, the plan was to have two practical testing phases. They actually moved it to one and shifting the effort more towards the digital to be, really be able to conduct more tests more cheaply, preparing for the next physical step. Thank you very much for, for these insights. I don't see more questions. 
only a uh, few minutes, but I, I wanted the answer from, yeah, because you presented this modeling of the charging network. Uh, and now when we are working on this, we, we see a lot of the, the problems or issues may come uh, from the grid, if the grid uh, able to cope with the uh, connection to get uh, megawatt charging where it's needed in the corridors, uh, was this part of the uh, the input for the model when you were proposing this, or is this more based on the logistics demand needs for charging without considering uh, the grid uh, as uh, one? Uh, element you may need to consider for placing the, the charging points? Uh, yes, you're very, very, very right, Fernando. Basically, when we started, <clears throat> started this study, uh, our main focus was how to develop um, kind of like models fighting with, the, with um, the current deficiencies of what we had as tools. And then, uh, then another thing that we were trying to figure out actually how to get good data. And luckily, we were relying in order to to prove uh, the methods we have developed on the Edis Plus database that has been developed uh, some years ago in connection to, to another project. But on the other hand, before you think about the grid side, uh, maybe the first the first point is like based on on the current demands. Uh, putting further thoughts, if we shift uh, the whole demand across Europe towards electric vehicles. What, uh, what 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 kind of for example what will be the demand what will be the energy demands in each country mm -hmm. and also considering the road network and considering the TNT corridors what further needs to be developed and then we hear the previous comments actually we need to think we need to seriously think about the grids because for example might be the case that in Nordics we don't have like good pro uh, we don't have like big problems with the grid, but this is not the case for other countries. But the starting point is uh, actually to through the research that we are doing and the methods that we are developing is to look further uh, how much uh, power is needed in, in every country, and then further on to look a bit more on the details. For example, taking into account. Uh, the grid practicalities and supporting uh, the policy makers in each and every one country uh, based on the needs, how they should, should rethink developing the energy infrastructure further to support the electromobility. Actually, what it was very interesting was to see the numbers you had on the thousands of uh, charging points, megawatt charges you needed for 15% of uh, electrification of freight, uh, road freight transportation and uh, for 15 percent uh, all those numbers that are like uh, Everest mountains uh, compared where we are now it's uh, it's really already giving us a very good dimension of the challenge that we have uh, ahead and then, then Georgia uh, I would I wanted to, to share you, you your project is in the in the middle part but uh, what you would like to to come and stress uh, your wish for the next time you are invited uh, for the final project. Actually, I would like to share some thoughts about the conference and what the results of the conference, what we should take. Uh, um, because we, um, this, we speak about digitization of road transport, and this is one of the things. And actually, when we speak about this, we think, we think of, uh, of electric and automatic automated, connected huh? vehicles in, uh, in a way in, in to come to the, to the logistics. But I think this is good to, to continue to work, but I think it's better also if we see, and I think the EFTI directive gives this opportunity to see how we, we integrate digitally the operation on the roads with the digital logistics environment and, and, and also with the overall optimization of urban or um, urban nodes in terms of the challenges that we have like uh, cities and uh, we know that freight and logistics represents a lot of a big part of the um, of the of the co2 and the emissions that we try to cut that is the one thing the second thing is that um, research projects will continue to 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 become i started my presentation following paulo's introduction saying that i have more than 25 experience uh, saying that I'm, I'm an old woman, huh? uh, when, I, when we started in the kickoff of the for, for freight, uh, we said, okay, what is the thing that we haven't heard as a problem in previous projects, okay? 
But I think we need a new generation of, of, of research projects, projects that um, uh, also to, to face the challenge that um, uh, Fernando says, we have results in control environments. Can we generalize these results? Um, we need to work on what I, what I call um, uh, logistics um, test beds, living labs, uh, uh, where uh, in real, uh, in at the nodal points, real uh, uh, infrastructure will be used in order to test the solutions and see if really we can, we can achieve that. Third point from my side, I think we need capacity building. A lot. Of, I, met, I gave an answer as capacity building for the cities, but I think we need capacity building also in the logistics sector about the new technology, about the physical internet, about the new things. Um, we see in the river environment really completely different contexts, like the one that we have in a, in a port, in a, in maritime ports. So we need to um, to come at the same level, and and therefore we need the capacity building and uh, to improve our readiness for accepting the new technology, the ecosystems to, to become ready for that. And finally, I don't know how it will come, but we need investment in new road infrastructure. <laughs> so this is really the That's big part. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I mean, the, no, in, in these roads, we cannot operate what we are thinking it will come as a reality in the future. Okay, now we are uh, heading to the end, uh, 6.30. Uh, thank you all for staying with us until the very end of this of this session. Thank you, the the, the panelists, and, and uh, it has been great to to act as moderator. I I want to to remind you that tomorrow we'll start at nine here with the parallel session. So then, get ready. You you see. The, the different sessions that you may choose uh, tomorrow. Uh, before uh, ending, I would like to uh, give the floor back to the chair of the session, uh, Paola Chiarini. Thank you, Fernando. Just uh, since we are over time, just one little uh, remark. Um, very nice wishful thinking list. I agree with that. Uh, but we are talking to DG Connect sometimes in MOVE, and we are already considering what we need to do for the future of digitalization. So really, um, even if it's a relatively new um, idea, this digitalization. So I wish to thank you, Fernando, the speakers, uh, Xavier for organizing perfectly this session and all of you. So have a, a very nice evening and uh, hopefully see you tomorrow again at the conference. Thank you, Paolo.